but the soil of the Huangpu River was too soft to resist the Lupu's weight. The ends would slide apart and the arch would collapse unless the engineers lashed the ends together. This is known as a tide arch. The builders stretched 16 cables between the arch bases. Eight cables would remain visible after the bridge was finished. The other eight would be hidden inside the road spans. Together they would act like the string on an archer's bow. Without their constant force, the arch would flatten. So when you have a loading on the arch, it creates a very high horizontal force, pushing the end of the, the bridge away. So you put a cable to tie them together so that this horizontal force is acting against each other in the cable. Maintenance crews will need to keep a close eye on the cables for as long as the bridge is standing. They will regularly test the tension to make sure it stays at about 22,000 tons. The Lupu Arch was now ready to carry the load of the roadway. Workers began to raise the 15 road deck sections. This was another heavy job. Some sections weighed 450,000 kilograms. For this step, the Huangpu River was not an obstacle. It was an asset. It allowed the enormous road spans to be floated to the construction site on boats. This was far easier than bringing them over land. On the 28th of June, 2003, the Lupu Bridge opened, two and a half years after construction started. The contractors had met their deadlines, despite the delays. Shanghai now had a showpiece, as well as a vital new traffic route. And China had its first record-setting span, the longest arch bridge ever built. But this victory was quickly overshadowed by China's insatiable need for bridges. The Chinese want to link their entire nation to form one modern economy. It was hard enough conquering the Huangpu River, which sliced Shanghai in half. But China had another river that cut the whole country in half. The Yangtze is China's longest river and the third longest in the world. It once divided China geographically and economically, a 6,300 kilometer obstacle to China's growth. Three hours west of Shanghai, the Chinese began to bridge this divide with one of their greatest mega spans yet. A suspension bridge called the Rin Yang. The Ring Yang needed to leap three times further than Shanghai's Lupu Bridge, more than a kilometer in a single bound. It would be the longest bridge the Chinese had ever built, and the third longest suspension bridge in the world. Its enormous twin towers would climb over 200 meters into the air. For residents on the Yangtze's north side, the bridge would mean faster and safer travel to Shanghai and a chance to share in China's new wealth. The north bank was cut off from Shanghai by the Yangtze. But now the Rin Yang would replace a ferry ride that could take two hours with a 10 minute drive. In 1998, 
designers began to address the idea of bridging the Yangtze between the ancient cities of Yongzhou and Jinjiang. But immediately they encountered a problem. Building a bridge directly between the two cities was impossible because the cities themselves extended right to the riverbanks. There was no extra room in which to add a bridge. Designers were therefore forced to build the bridge to the west, but here the gulf between shores more than doubled. Building the bridge here would demand three megastructures, a 400-meter bridge to the north, an elevated highway across the small island, and a massive bridge to the south. The Yangtze was a difficult place to build one bridge, let alone two. The current was swift and the soil was unstable. And every summer the Yangtze flooded, often with disastrous results. A deluge just months before construction started inundated an area larger than England. If there was a severe flood during construction of the Rin Yang, it could cripple the project. Builders tackled the North Bridge first, where the shorter distance made their job easier. They erected a cable-stayed bridge, the cheapest and simplest design. The roadway was supported by cables attached directly to two towers. This 400-meter structure had no trouble spanning the river's north channel. Cable-stayed bridges have been built that are twice the length needed here. It was a huge construction project, but not record-breaking. The state-of-the-art design looked stunning, both day and night. But the builders of the South Bridge faced far greater challenges. The distance they had to build across was almost four times as far. Too far for a cable-stayed bridge to reach without putting several towers in the river. And engineers couldn't put any bridge towers in the Yangtze. The South Channel was the main shipping route around the island. There was a constant crush of boats. If just one vessel strayed off course and rammed a bridge pier, the damage would potentially be catastrophic. Engineers learned this the hard way when a ship collision destroyed a bridge and lives in the United States. The Chinese engineers faced a long list of challenges in their attempt to bridge the Yangtze River. The water was over a kilometer wide, and typhoons and earthquakes could strike at any time. But by far the biggest threat to the bridge was a wayward ship. In Florida in 1980, the 20,000-ton Summit Venture destroyed the Sunshine Skyway Bridge. The ship was navigating Florida's Tampa Bay in bad weather. It lost radar, veered off course, and slammed into a bridge support. The central span collapsed. The crash killed 35 people, including 26 traveling on a bus that careened off the bridge. The Rin Yang's builders did not intend to risk such a tragedy. They would base as much of their bridge on land as they could, and only one design could leap the huge distance and keep the towers near shore, a suspension bridge. The design for the Rin Yang, like every modern suspension bridge, relied on two main cables that stretched from one shore to the other. At each end, the meter-thick cables were rigidly anchored. But everywhere else, the main cables could and would move, even across the top of the towers. 
the towers were like tent poles, propping up the cables. But the cables were simply draped over the top. If the main cables were anchored to the tower tops, the towers would not be able to withstand the pulling forces. They would tumble inwards and the entire structure would be lost. Hanging down from the main cables were 360 suspender cables. These would hold the road spans. And these joints were also made to move. This flexibility would help the bridge to survive extreme poundings from earthquakes and typhoons. If the Green Yang could be built as designed, it would be the third longest suspension bridge in the world. It would have towers that soared 70 stories and a span that would stretch almost one and a half kilometers. Only one tower would sit in the Yangtze River. Just two other bridges in the world had longer spans. Denmark's Great Belt and Japan's Akashi Kikyo. Construction of the Rinyang Bridge began in February 2001. The project was so important to China that President Zhang Zemin himself attended the groundbreaking. The builders had five years to complete the project. The first step was the bridge towers. Because the towers needed to withstand tremendous downward forces from the cables, engineers wanted to plant them on bedrock. But the Yangtze mud was incredibly thick. To reach solid footing, the builders needed to sink 32 piles at each tower site. These piles would act like giant stilts, standing on the bedrock below and supporting the 200 meter towers above. This was a critical step to ensure that the towers remained upright. If they started to tilt, there could be no stopping them. Before builders could finish the bridge, they needed to solve another critical problem. It was imperative that the anchor blocks that held the main cables were not able to move. But the ground here was so muddy and weak that the cables could have pulled the anchor blocks out of place. Overcoming this weak link would be the most difficult and dangerous job of the entire project. China's Rinyang Bridge would be the third longest suspension bridge in the world. Loads on its main cables would be enormous. The cables would tug at their anchor blocks with the force of 68 million kilograms. Designers needed to prevent the anchor blocks from moving or the bridge could collapse. To do this, builders would have to extend the anchor blocks at least 30 meters underground. They would be the largest anchor blocks the Chinese had ever built. But when engineers probed the riverbank, they discovered that the soil was worse than muddy. It was laced with underground water. This was a major setback. Engineers would have to find a way to divert the groundwater, or watery mud would pour into any hole they dug. And it could enter so fast that it would trap the men working inside. The engineers devised a plan. They decided to keep the water at bay by erecting a gigantic underground dam. 